We're moving right through this study on uh, the subject of what? Love. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm getting a few uh, facts down. How many characteristics of love? 16, yes. Uh, true or false? Some are positive, some are negative. I heard a kind of a true over here. That's true. Uh, what do we mean when we say a negative characteristic? What do we mean by that? A negative characteristic. Yes, yeah, something that love does not do. Okay, And then we talk about a positive quality. What do we mean by that? Something that love does do. Okay, And they're half and half in the chapter. And we've dealt with a bunch of things that love does not do. Okay, And then Paul starts on a list of positives at the end of the list. In fact, there are... Um, Six positives, I believe, that he mentions right in a row. Okay, Charity rejoiceth in the truth. That's the one we talked about the last time. He then gets into verse 7, and he has four qualities there that he talks about. And the first one says this, Charity beareth all things. Wow. I wasn't going to hand the outline out at first because I wanted you to ask, answer a question for me, but if you get the outline, you read my outline, then you already have the answer, and that's not fair. But anyway, I have a list there of some things. I, and it goes like this. What do tabloids, debates, elections, and church problems all have in common? I've given you the answer, haven't I? What's the answer? Somebody just read it if you want to. Yes. They all enjoy exposing the faults, the sins, and the dirt on somebody else, don't they? That's why you buy a tabloid. You want to know the dirt. Isn't that right? Get up there to line in Walmart, and there's about 15 tabloids up there, you know. And, and you read something about one of your favorite stars, and it's nasty and just ugly. And you say, ooh, I need to read about that. Okay? And so you buy that copy plus the one next to it, because you just can't hardly get your feel of dirt. Okay? Somebody divorces, and guess what? Oh, man, is there dirt spread? Oh, there's a lot of divorces. There, there's very few pretty divorces. You know, a divorce anyway is not pretty, is it? It's not pretty, but, but you know, the very minute you divorce, well, she did this, and she didn't do this, and he did that, and they just spread it to everybody. Got to tell my family, got to tell my neighbors, I got to tell my friends, got to tell everybody, so everybody knows I'm good, and he's evil. Right? So we just spread the dirt. Elections? Oh, boy, if you've had your television on, you know, you didn't have to have a television on, <laughs> you know, uh, to know that elections get dirty, don't they? And, and we just want to spread the dirt, don't we? As much dirt as you can find, spread it, right? And guess what, guys? The church is not immune to that. You wait until a church goes through church problems, and guess what? Brothers and sisters in Christ who've been friends for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, all of a sudden, boom, a church problem. Those individuals are ripped one side to another. And guess what? All they can do is talk about how ugly and dirty and sinful and nasty the other ones are. It's unbelievable. Okay? It's just unbelievable. Notice point number three there. I like that. Notice that they... Bear, B-A-R-E, all things. But guess what they don't do? They do not bear, B-E-A-R, all things. That's interesting, isn't it? Just a little bit difference in spelling is all it takes. Paul says, charity beareth all things. We need to know what that means, don't we? 
Okay. Uh, sometimes we read a word and we think we know what a word means, don't we? We think we know what a word means. Beareth all things. What do you think it means? Somebody just... Charity beareth all things. Tolerates all There's There's one that, that's there. Tolerates all things. What else? What's that? Withstands all things. Okay. Susan? Okay, Jim. Okay, Gil. Long suffering. Okay, guys. Tolerance, withstanding. Uh, showing kindness in that withstanding, um, offering forgiveness, um, you know, in, in the face of persecution, being lost. All of those things are involved in love, but they are not involved in the word beareth all things. Okay? It's a unique word. Okay? Give people the benefit of the doubt. Ah, okay. What we're going to do is we're going to do our three things that we normally do. Okay, we're going to define the word. Then we're going to look at some Bible examples of what we're talking about. And then we'll make some application of those things in our lives. Okay, And uh, it's, it's a very interesting word. Notice how Strong's defines it. What if you only had the first part of Strong? Strong says that it means to roof over. To roof over. That's what beareth all things means. To roof over. That's a weird definition, isn't it? But then he goes on to say this, to say this figuratively, to cover with silence. Okay, to cover with silence. Thayer says that it means to deck, thatch, to cover. Now watch this next one. To protect or keep by what? By covering. Now keep that word in mind, to what? To protect or keep. By covering. He goes on to say exactly what they are, I mean what Strong says, to cover over with silence, to keep secret, to hide, to conceal of the errors or faults of another. By covering, to keep off something which threatens, to bear up against. Robertson says that this word means to throw a veil over. Notice how this article entitled uh, Sparkling Gems from the Greek defines the word love, protects, shields, guards, covers, conceals, and safeguards people from what? From exposure. Wow. Scroggy in his commentary on this word says this, the word here is highly pictorial. It is employed of holding fast like a watertight vessel. It is used of a roof which does not leak. It is used of troops defending a fortress. It is used of ice bearing weight and not giving way. Folks, love is like, um, man, maybe the best way I can describe it. Love is like putting something in a Tupperware box and doing what? Sealing it tight. My mom always told me when you get a Tupperware thing, you got to burp it, right? You know, psst, get the air out, you know. So it does what? So you make certain it is sealed tight, right? Nothing leaks out. Nothing pours out. Okay? Sealed tight. Um, I've talked to two or three individuals of our congregation even and uh, guys, uh, there's a few in our number who have had some water leaks due to the hurricane. It's kind of frustrating, isn't it? You know, you look up there and there's a big old water spot and you go, oh man, 
You know, just sickening. Okay? And uh, so that tells you that your roof isn't what? Roof isn't sealed tight, is it? Okay? It needs some sealing. It, it's what? It's leaking. And folks, that's not what a roof's supposed to do. Okay? I don't care if you grew up that way or not. That's not what a roof is supposed to do. A roof is supposed to seal things tightly and not let anything in. That's what this word, beareth all things, means. Now what's interesting is how it's translated in the versions, okay? And I believe that there's only one of these translations that really expresses what the word beareth means. Now, it's accurately translated with the word beareth, okay? But you have to understand the meaning of the term, don't you? Okay? Uh, the King James Version, the American Standard Version, New King James, New American Standard, and the uh, English Standard Version, they all say the same thing. Love, charity, beareth, bears all things. But then look at the NIV. Love always what? Protects. What's the definition Strong gave of beareth? To roof over. To what? To protect. To protect. Okay? That's what the word means. To protect. New Living Translation says, never gives up. Look at this next one, Phillips. Love knows no limit to its endurance. Guys, we're going to read of that quality of endurance in another term. Love endures all things. Okay? So that's not what Paul is meaning in this verse. He doesn't say love endures all things and then just two words later, love endures all things. That's, that's not what he's talking about. Not in this particular passage. Notice how the message puts it, and I, I don't believe that's true. Love puts up with what? With anything. That ain't right. They don't put up with everything. Okay? Love what? Love protects. Love roofs over. Okay? Love puts something in a watertight vessel and seals it over. Okay? That's what love does. Now let's look at some examples of this thing called beareth all things. Remember I told you if I had this thing to do over, I would put in a whole other section of study in every one of these lessons about how this concept of love applies to the church at Corinth. Folks, Corinth did not love one another. Okay? Corinth despised one another. And they show that by their actions on a continual basis. And one of the things that they would do is they would go and they would find a little something that somebody had done, a little trivial matter, and guess what? Next thing you knew, you were getting a subpoena to court. By who? By your own brother in Christ. He stepped on my shoe and scuffed it. He owes me $50. Are, are you kidding he took my seat and I was discomforted because I have to sit under the air conditioner and I got a cold and he's going to pay my doctor bills. Trivial, little, nothing stuff. And guess what they were doing? They were going to the courts and they were making this big deal out of all of these little things suing their brother at law. Notice what Paul says in verse uh, 6 of chapter 6. But brethren goeth to law with brethren, and that before unbelievers. Just go out there and expose your garbage to everybody. When you look at verse 2, he says, the smallest matters. Okay? Um, guys, that's not what love is. Love doesn't find all the little nitpicky things of each little person and go out here and do what? Expose all that for everybody to see. You know what? I got a lot of flaws. And you want to know what I think God, Kathleen, doesn't do? Expose them to everybody. You know that? I'm glad she does it. She loves me enough not to do that. You know that? 
Every one of us can look at our children, we can look at our grandchildren, whatever, and guess what? There's problems, there's flaws, aren't there? But you know what we don't do? You don't go around just telling everybody in the world all the troubles of everybody in your family. Unless you're going through a divorce, and then you do. Then, then you get out your list you know, that you stored away in your computer and you memorize all those hundred points and you rattle them off to everybody you come in contact. He's a scum bucket. Let me tell you why. He's been a scum bucket for a long time. We've known this. We just ain't said it to anybody. Yeah, you used to what? You used to love him. And now what? You hate him. And there's the difference. See, love did what? Love covered it. And hate does what? Hate exposes it. Okay. Paul told the church at Corinth that they should have done two things. Number one, they should have took the wrong, first of all. Okay. He said you should have just suffered the wrong. And he says if you can't do that, then you should have taken these matters in hand where? Among the brethren. He says aren't there those in the church who can handle these little matters like that? Okay rather than going out here before unbelievers and just exposing the world to the problems. It's ridiculous. we got several examples in the Bible of individuals who uh, covered sin, okay, in the sense of put a covering over it, made it tight, didn't want to just reveal it and expose it to the whole world per se. And one of the best ones is in John the 8th chapter. In fact, we really have a contrast between those who hated and Jesus who loved. Okay? The Jews go out and they find this woman and she was taken in adultery. What they say, the very act. Folks, they jerked her out of the very bed in which she was lying. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Guess who they didn't bring? They didn't bring the man. That shows you immediately that if she was caught in the act there had to be another one there they didn't bring him may have been one of their pharisaical brothers you know what I don't know but see first of all they didn't bring both so this is this is not a fair setting they didn't bring the woman for justice did they they brought the woman for one purpose and that was to tempt Jesus and to see if they could find fault with Him. And what do they do? They take a woman's sin and they just expose it publicly. Okay? Just expose it. We all know the story, don't we? Jesus bends down, writes on the dust, tells them, let him that hath no sin cast the first stone. The elderly drift away first. The young are finally gone. Finally, there's no one there, is there? And at the conclusion, what is it happens? When Jesus had lift up Himself, this is verses 10 and 11 of, Act, of John 8, and saw none but the woman, He said unto her, Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Folks, Jesus was not going to make a spectacle out of this woman especially in the manner in which this particular action was being conducted. Okay? Now yes, that little group of Jews, whoever they were, who brought her, they all knew about it. Right? But finally, everybody was gone, and guess what Jesus didn't do? He didn't make this big deal out of this thing. He told the woman, go thy way and sin no more. I find it interesting about how Jesus dealt with Judas, don't you? Did Jesus know that Judas was going to betray him? Oh yeah, he knew. He knew exactly who he was. In fact, he said, one of you is the devil on one occasion, didn't he? He knew. One of you is going to, to, to deny me. One of you is going to betray me. Okay. And so here they are, they're in the upper room, right? 
The events of the night are about to unfold. Judas is about to complete his dastardly deed. And what a wonderful time just to expose Judas just as big as you can expose him, right? Hey guys, come here. You see that disciple Judas? He's about to betray me. You need to know that. Is that the way Jesus handled that that night? It's interesting the way Jesus handles it, isn't it? In fact, when, when it all is done and said, guess who doesn't know anything? The other disciples. They still don't know. I bet you when Judas walks up in the Garden of Gethsemane with all of those Jews trailing behind him and kisses Jesus as a betrayal kiss, they were literally astounded. Oh, there's the what? There's the traitor. Because they didn't know. Listen to the text. When Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom He spake. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of His disciples whom Jesus loved. I've never really... Uh, picked up on this next statement. Listen to this. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be that he spake. Peter didn't want to ask. That's a first for Peter. Isn't it? Now remember, they're all kind of laid on the floor there okay? because they all you laid down when you ate. And he could see John. And can you just see old Peter? John's going, you know, it's going, that's what he says. He beckoned unto him to what? Who, who are you talking about? Okay, I'd just like to have been there and seen even that little display. That'd been kind of funny. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It's Judas Iscariot. Is that what he said? Didn't say that. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, I'm, I'm baffled by all this still, okay, as I read this, but still. Now listen to this. And after the sop, Judah, uh, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. So he takes the sop, gives it to him, and now... It's time for the deed to be done. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Then having received the sop, he went out immediately, or he went immediately out, and it was night. But guess what? They had no clue. Did they? Folks, it's the manner in which it was done, wasn't it? Jesus knew this man's about to betray me. He knows this guy's about to sell me out. And what does he do? Puts a covering over it, doesn't he? He protects this man. He still loves this man. Okay, this man is his what? He's my disciple. He's one that I've chosen. He's one that's been with me the last three and a half years. He loves the man. Could Judas have been a good apostle even after this? Boy, y'all are pretty... No, no, no way. You know, he's a devil. He's going to always be a devil. Okay? No, guys, he could, he could have repented. Just like Peter, he could have repented. He could have, done, he could have changed all this, couldn't he? Okay? And, and Jesus knows that too. It's just amazing the way he does it. What about Apollos in Acts the 18th chapter? Okay, here's old Apollos and he's out preaching, right? The Bible says that he's an eloquent man, that he's well knowledge, has much knowledge of the Scripture and he knows how to expound upon the Scripture, but he only knows what? The baptism of John. Ooh, that false teacher! Get out of here! I'm going to send a little note to one of the Brotherhood publications so he can write him up. You know what? Is that what they did to him? 
What do they do to him? Quill and Priscilla hear him, right? And what do they do? They take him aside and they teach him the way of the Lord more, pub, more, more perfectly. Took him aside and taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. You see, guys, love has, a, has this desire not to hurt. Love has a desire to do what? To cover, to protect, to the best that it possibly can. Now let's look real quickly at the application. Love keeps us safe by its very nature. It is a foolproof security system. It wraps us in acceptance and guards us in its embrace. If you truly love somebody, you're not out there to harm them. You're not out there to expose them to the world. Notice this next statement. When we're in relationships, we learn and know much about our mate, our companion, our friend, our brothers and sisters in Christ, don't we? Folks, the closer you get, the more you what? The more you know. And sometimes what you know ain't pretty. <laughs> Isn't that true? Sometimes you find out something about someone, you say, I wish I never knew that. But now you know it. Now what are you going to do with it? Okay? This individual's got a personality flaw. Okay? And, and, and there are some flaws out there in personalities. This individual has some, some weaknesses that he deals with. This individual has some medical problems or maybe he has some mental problems. Maybe there's some temptations that he struggles with. Maybe you find out there's sin in his life. Oh, tell everybody. Go publish this. Get on the phone. Guess what I just found out about Sister So-and-so. Unbelievable. And you call that love? Love what? Protects, folks. Notice point two. Love protects the person from exposure. Love puts an airtight cover over the flaws and reveals it to no one. To bear all things is to hate. Notice the spelling. B-A-R-E. To bear all things is to hate. To bear all things, B-E-A-R, is to love. Folks, we have to develop the ability to be confidential within the church. The definition of com confidentiality is this. Having another's trust, being able to keep things private and secret. And there are many actions that we can engage in that will go totally against confidentiality. Gossip, tail-bearing, slandering, and character assassination. It's not what we're here for. We're here to do what? We're here to love. Okay? Now notice point C because this is important. Paul doesn't suggest that love pretends there are no problems. Okay? That's not what we're saying. It attempts to keep problems private. Love does not ignore someone's problems, but it refuses to give the problems a spotlight. After Jesus cleared the mob, he looked at that woman and he said, Go thy way! And there's a period there, right? No. What did he tell her? And sin no more. I know you were in sin. They caught you in sin. I know you have. Jesus deals with the sin, but he deals with it how? Just as privately as he can, doesn't he? Aquila and Priscilla took a policy unto themselves and instructed him in the way of the Lord more perfectly. Acts 18, verse 26. Folks, what does Jesus tell us to do when we have difficulties with our brethren? Go to them in private and talk to them. Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between, them and, between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. I want to keep it where? As private as I possibly can. Why? Because I love you. I don't want to expose you to all humanity. You see, what happens in tabloids, what happens in divorces, what happens in elections, what happens in church problems, folks, is we quit loving. Okay? And all there is is this unbelievable display of hatred toward others. Sad, isn't it? And what happens to us a lot of times is that our emotions are the things that drive us, aren't they? Okay? And we're going to do everything we can do to make ourselves look good, to, to, to do whatever we need to do, get elected, whatever it is, you know, and 
we quit practicing love toward other individuals. 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That doesn't say it neglects it, it overlooks it. It says it covers. It puts that what? Puts that seal over it. Okay? If we cannot protect one another as Christians, folks, who's going to protect us? Who's going to do it? You know, that's what love's about, trying to protect one another. Now, yes, occasionally we have to practice church discipline, don't we? And the Bible acknowledges that. But that's not where we start, is it? Okay? It's not to be the way we handle ourselves as individual Christians. Pretty good, uh, pretty potent little statement right there. Okay? Thank you all.